Welcome to Viewpoints. My name is Heather Isveron, and with me today is a very special guest, Dr. Philip Zimbardo, Professor of Psychology at Stanford University since 1968, current faculty here at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security for the last five years, and author of the new book, The Lucifer Effect. Welcome, Doctor. Welcome, Heather. Great to be here. Thank you. I just wanted to go over your book a little bit and talk about Homeland Security, and um, just wanted to ask you a couple questions. Sure. First, uh, why did you write the book? Well, the idea for this book began percolating actually on April 28, 2004, when I saw on 60 Minutes 2 those horrendous images of American soldiers abusing Iraqi detainees in Abu Ghraib prison. I was shocked, like most people are, not only in America but around the world, that, that anyone could do this to prisoners who are supposed to be in their protective custody. But I wasn't at all surprised because I had seen those same visual images 35 years earlier in the prison that I created at Stanford, which got to be known as the Stanford Prison Experiment. Guards putting prisoners' bags over prisoners' heads, guards stripping prisoners naked, and guards forcing prisoners to engage in sexually degrading activities. In our study, after five days, our good guards were having the bad prisoners simulate sodomy, knowing at some level it was an experiment, knowing at some level it's a mock prison, knowing that it was only by a flip of the coin, by random assignment, that I put good guards, good students to play guards or prisoners. So anybody who was a guard knew by a flip of the coin they could be at the other end. And after a few days, it didn't make a difference. They began to think of the prisoners as dangerous and therefore justifying repressive actions. I should say, uh, just very briefly, is that we went, we went out of our way to pick two dozen of the most normal, healthy college students we could find. Not Stanford students, these were kids all from all over the United States who were in the Stanford area finishing summer school. I put an ad in the city newspaper and we got about 75 people applying. I gave them all a battery of psychological tests. We did background interviews and picked those two dozen, normal, healthy, on all dimensions. And so here, 35 years later, is these visual parallels. Mm. But I didn't know if it went, went any deeper than that, whether they're psychological parallels. And of course, what happened is immediately after this, the exposure of, of these images, uh, a military spokesman came on and said, the, these are only a few bad apples, these are a few rogue soldiers. 99.9% .9 of American soldiers are upstanding, good, these are the bad ones. Well, I went on NPR, another station, said that could be true, but without knowing, how do we know it's not good American soldiers put in a bad barrel? And then I was fortunate because one of the people listening to me on, on NPR was a lawyer for one of these uh, guards, Sarge, Staff Sergeant Chip Frederick. And he invited me to be on, on the defense team. That meant I could have access to all the investigative reports, all those images, and most importantly, access to this young man and his family. And I had access to his whole background, his military background, his background as a correctional officer in a small prison in, in Virginia. And so this book really takes your career through a full circle. You mean Absolutely. you served as an expert witness? In the yeah, so I was an expert witness in his trial and literally got to know everything there is to know about uh, this young man, the other, the other uh, uh, seven soldiers who were involved in the night shift, and, al and also a great deal about what that prison was like. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my book, I have two whole chapters on uh, Abu Ghraib, the place, the behavioral context, uh, the trial, and the consequences. And then I have a whole second chapter which says, we're now going to put the system on trial for creating a really horrendous situation that Frederick and these other military policemen were forced to, to live in and work in. Uh, and, and I use there as the evidence of why the system uh, it was complicit all of the reports by these uh, various investigating committees. Uh, 10 of 11 of them were headed by generals, and one was by James Schlesinger, who was a former Secretary of Defense, assigned to this task by Rumsfeld. So these are not really independent. Uh, and so in the book, I s cite chapter and verse. Here's what these reports tell us about why these abuses occurred. The subtitle of your book is Understanding How Good People Turn Evil. And in your experience, is there such a delicate fine line of good people being exposed to bad things. How, how delicate is that line? Well, we really all like to believe that that line between good and evil is impermeable. It's a wall. And we are good people on this side, and the bad guys are on that side. 
And all the research I've done, uh, and I, I, in the book I go through in excruciating detail the Stanford Prison Study, day by day chronology of how these good young men were corrupted by the situation that I created. And then I have two whole chapters on all of the social psychological literature that supports the notion that situations can seduce or corrupt good people to do bad things. The important thing about understanding why these evils occur, I have to say at first, does not excuse it. This is not, psychology is not excusiology. Trying to understand something is, is not absolving the people of, uh, of their accountability. But it says, if you want to change the behavior, it's not enough to punish the evildoer. You have to understand what is the cause, what is the dynamics that, that are causing this. And my argument is that we in psychology, psychiatry, but law, medicine, uh, and religion all take the, the focus on the person, mm -hmm. as guilty, as, as uh, pa pathological, as the sinner, and so forth. And then our whole treatment is uh, do something to change the person. In the extreme, you put him in prison or execute him. I'm arguing what we need not only uh, to understand these kind of things, but central to whole approach to terrorism, you need to take a public health model. Yeah. The public health model says there are disease vectors that affect individuals. And if all you do is deal with the individual and leave, and leave the, the disease vector there, you know the, the epidemic is going to spread. So public health model says we want to inoculate people against the disease, not wait till they get it and treat them. So this is what's wrong with using a medical model uh, in psychiatry, uh, in religion, or there's, no, there's nothing built in for how you prevent something that's undesirable. It's almost as if you wait till it happens and then you do something about it. And so this is the kind of thing I've been trying to do at my course here with uh, Dr. Breckenridge, uh, is to say, how do we understand terrorism, not as the pathology in a few terrorists, but as a system, as a complex system, where individuals who end up doing suicide bombing or terrorist activity are part of a network, a system, uh, and if you want to change suicide, uh, terrorism, you have to understand what is the psychological dynamics underlying the recruitment process, underlying why someone becomes a terrorist, not simply the witch identification and destruction program, not let's find the terrorist, get him to confess, and then put him in prison or execute him, right. because the world is filled with an infinite number of terrorists in waiting. Right. So you would say that going, uh, looking forward, are we any closer to adopting that model through Abu Ghraib? Are there any, um, what are the challenges going forward well, to making that actually happen? Well, Heather, I think one of the important lessons that we have learned from, from the abuse in this prison is, and these are outlined in every one of those generals report, saying these abuses would not have occurred or these abuses would have been prevented had military discipline been followed, one, had there been responsible, accountable leadership, which there was not, and three, had these soldiers been given mission-specific training. The military has covered up, these are army reservists, these are weekend soldiers who had zero training to be in a combat zone in the middle of a war, in this prison that was under constant bombardment, and no training to do the kinds of incredibly difficult job they were asked to do. Not only that, the reason these abuses occurred in Tier 1A, night shift, is that was the interrogation center. That's, that was a military intelligence hole. And there were CIA there, there were uh, uh, civilian uh, interrogators from the Titan Corporation, and all of those three units are now putting pressure on these Army reservists, military policemen, to soften the prisons up, prepare them for interrogation, because all these abuses occurred between September and, I guess, December 2003. Right in the middle of that was the height of the the first insurgency. And we didn't understand where it was coming from. And so we were arresting all the men in, in a whole village. So suddenly, Chip Frederick was in charge of all of this. He starts off being in charge of 200 uh, detainees. And in a month, he's in charge of 1,000. Mm -hmm. So there's no facilities, not even uniforms. So th they're naked. There's, there's, there's uh, no, uh, not enough showers. There's not enough toilets. So it's this totally chaotic place. And the pressure is from top down, from, from Rumsfeld, from the, uh, General Miller, General Sanchez, you know, on the, these interrogators, get actionable intelligence, and they in turn put the pressure on these military policemen, help us get, but that's not the job of military police. Military police are there to protect, maintain the security of the prison, of the prisoners. So it's a basic violation of the relationship between military intelligence and military police. 
And not once in three months did a senior officer ever come down to that basement because it was dangerous, it was filthy, it was horrible. And so there was zero accountability. So you never get these kinds of abuses. You don't get them in other prisons where there is responsible leadership from the superintendent, the warden, in, 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 in corporate world, the CEO has, has to be in charge. And so that's a big message that it's not about a few bad apples. It's about a system that, that become part of this system becomes dysfunctional because leaders abdicate their responsibility. The job that they're being paid for is setting clear guidelines, rules of engagement, and then providing the oversight and then the punishment for people who fail to follow through. Do you think the lesson was learned through that entire uh, exercise and horrible uh, account? See, I don't, I don't think the lesson was learned sufficiently uh, because the moment you rush to blame the few people, this happens not only in the military, every time there's a scandal in any major police department, the front page is it's a few bad apples. Once you take that notion, it protects the system against change. Right. Rather than say, we're going to investigate why this happened, we're going to try to understand the underlying dynamics to see, is it the people, is it the situation they're in, or is it something the si system is not doing? So that's the main thing I say in the Lucifer Effect is, whenever we want to understand any complex behavior, like Abu Ghraib, or like terrorism, you have to have this multiple approach. You have to say, let's understand everything about the people involved. You know, what, what can we understand about the profile of terrorists, the background of terrorists, uh, the religious back? And then we have to say, what is the situation they're operating in? And so there, it's, we have to understand their culture, we have to understand their religion, their, their family and tribal connections. Um, terrorism is different in each country because they're totally different uh, histories that they're working on, different cultural uh, matrices. And then we have to understand, what is the system? The military system, the correctional system, in this case, the terrorist system that's supporting this. Now, we keep saying it's Al-Qaeda. Well, Al-Qaeda is only a small part of all the terrorist networks. And I think being obsessed with Osama bin Laden has misdirected some of our attention to, to less um, visible, uh, less uh, visually dramatic uh, uh, terrorist leaders. Well, your book is quite remarkable and has won lots of praise. Uh, if people are more curious about uh, the book, where would you direct them? Oh, we have a wonderful website simply called www.lucifereffect.com, one word. In it, we have a lot of things about the book, about me. There's going to be a Hollywood movie. But also, I put in a lot of new information about celebrating heroism, about dehumanization. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Stanford Prison Study, in great detail, there's all the video clips and, and uh, images and everything I've written about uh, torture, about uh, Stanford Prison Experiment is all there. And it's not only there, it's free and everything is downloadable. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Heather, thank you. Love to be here.